All right. Uh, good morning. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Selamat pagi. Uh, thank you everyone for joining us today. Uh, so today we have Dr. Frederick Sinegar. Um, he's an expert in mesophotic corals, which is the deeper, uh, the twilight zone coral ecosystems. Uh, he received his PhD uh, on a joint program between Marcelo in France and University of Geneva in Switzerland. Uh, so we are very excited to have him today. Uh, we were planning to have it last week, but uh, from some very tight schedule on my side and also a hurricane on his side, uh, we postponing it to today. So finally, we're here. Uh, for us from the Research Center for Deep Sea, uh, mesophotic corals is one of the research topics that we want to uh, concentrate on uh, because in Indonesia, we are known to be this uh, heaven of coral reef and we have many, many studies on coral reef and many, many experts. Uh, but so far, we've been focusing, of course, on the shallow uh, coral reef side. Uh, while it is a very interesting ecosystem, if we go deeper, we can explore more. Uh, there's a lot of um, theories also about this. But yes, as a, ooh, we have a baby. Hello, Cory. <laughs> it's okay. Yes. Uh, so yes, we want to learn more uh, from the experts on mesophotic corals. And we want to advance this research in Indonesia because a lot of uh, new inventions, new uh, new knowledge, we're basically waiting uh, if we explore it. And uh, Dr. Frederick Senegar is also a National Geographic Explorer. Uh, some of us here are also uh, myself, Cory, who else are explorer? And yeah, at least in this room right now. So uh, yes, yeah, so I hope everybody can tune in. Uh, although this is biology, but I think because of the novelty of the research in Indonesia, we also need a lot of collaborations from those in uh, chemistry, in physical oceanography to fully understand this ecosystem in Indonesia. So without further ado, uh, Frederick, time is yours. Yeah, thank you for the very nice introduction. And let me just put where on my share screen. Check. And you probably don't see anything, but now do you see the scale, right? Yes. Uh, you see the slide. Oh, okay. Good. So, um, sorry, the sound is disturbing. Um, so I will present you a little bit an overview of our mesophotic core research in Okinawa. And uh, this research, I must say, like I am presenting it, but it's really a joint work with uh, actually Saki Hadi, which is the head of the lab here. And it's now more than 10 years we are working on that together. She's more of an ecologist. Uh, she's expert in coral reproduction. You will see in my talk, there is a lot of her input on this reproduction. And I'm more oriented towards the diversity. And so we, we form a team and we are working on that together. So uh, what are mesophotic coral ecosystems? Basically, uh, do you see my little arrow maybe, I hope? Um, so they are the parts of the coral reef that are found below 30 meter depths, about to down to over 100 meters and even below 170 meters in French Polynesia, for example. So the limits, it's not a strict depth limit. It's more defined by the light. And as you can see, like the light decreased drastically. And at about 30 meters, you have roughly 10% of the surface light. And then this goes to only 55 meters. But if we go down at 80 meters, you have 0.1% of the surface light in average in our region. This, of course, depends on the different places. But I would say that maybe a interesting um, concept for the mesophotic would be below 10% of the surface irradiance, roughly. There is also the temperature because, of course, the depths isolate the, the reefs from the extreme temperature that we have in the shallow reefs. However, it does not mean that it is much more stable. We advertised it as more stable. 
a lot. But actually, the temperature are variable, are highly variable at depths because we have those internal waves and uh, deep sea. So it's, there is this cool water impact that can be quite drastic depending on the places. Uh, one thing I'm very, very happy that Intan like invited me to give this seminar because the mesophotic coral ecosystem, the mesophotic zone is basically too deep for shallow coral researcher and it's too shallow for the deep sea researcher. So it, it was largely ignored. And I'm very happy that the deep sea center of Brin is actually interested to include the mesophotic coral ecosystem in their programs, because I think this is very, very much needed. So um, back to those light and temperature conditions. So there is low light, but there is a bit less disturbance also from storm and so on. So several people suggested that there might be a refuge for shallow corals under thermal stress, for example. And this was the deep reef refugia hypothesis. And this drove a lot of research in the last decade on those ecosystems, including ours, actually. But right now, there is a little bit of backlash in the mesophotic community that deep reef refugia is not working, is a crap, and we should consider those ecosystems as unique. And I think, honestly, they are both. Um, so the one big point from me who is concerned in diversity is that if it is a refuge for shallow coral, that means that we must find shallow corals at these depths. And so, like, there is no point to have, like, there is a point, but if those ecosystems are protected from bleaching, but there is no shallow coral species, then the refuge is not really effective. So we need to know how much of the shallow coral diversity can extend uh, deeper. But uh, like I mentioned, like lately, there is another trend in mesophotic research with tech diver going deeper and deeper to say that those are unique ecosystems that we find completely different species adapted to the low light environments. And for me, you will see through my talk, I think they are both, they can be both unique and refuge. And I think it depends a lot on the depths we go. The upper mesophotic, like 30, 40 meter, will have lots of similarities with the shallow reefs. While if you go down to 100 meters or the very deepest uh, limits, you will see more unique communities. So in Japan, we know very little still about mesophotic coral ecosystem. We should know more since we are working that since on that since 10 years. But um, we mostly focused our studies around Okinawa Island. And I will show you a little bit later like how interesting it is to, we are just really in an ideal place here in Sezoko. We are just here on the north part of Okinawa Island on the top right of your of the map on your screen. And we also did a few surveys I will present in further south uh, in Ishigaki Island, notably. And Taiwan would be just out of the map to give you an idea of where we are. Uh, so one of the first studies in the world on mesophotic coral ecosystem was actually from Okinawa. And it was from Dr. Yamazoto in 1967, who just went with a submersible to explore the fisheries resource. And because he was a coral researcher, he could not help but take notes on the coral covers and coral diversity he found. And he recorded something that looked like a coral, but he's not sure if it's a coral or a forum at 102 meter. And else he noted one other coral at 100 meter, but there is no information on this coral. So, we assume the deepest record of corals at the moment in Okinawa is 102 meter, but it might be 100 meter, but it's around this zone. And we, of course, have no samples from there. Uh, in Okinawa, we have different types of MCs, and I think this is all over the world, but we are very lucky around our station to have three big different types of profile. Uh, we have vertical walls, and I think you have a lot of these in Indonesia those big drop off that go just straight down. And those are interesting because they provide shading depending on the orientation. So you will have deep fauna 
coming shallower because they they take advantage of the shade provided by those cliffs. But then we have also gentle slope that allow for more dense coral communities because there is more light. And the best place to have light at depths is uh, what they call in Japan sone, which is like a bank or like little seamount somehow that uh, around our station, we have a few where the tops are around 60 meter, 65 meter or 90 meter. And those are basically sunken reef that could not catch up. And so there is no shading. They are usually quite offshore. So the water is quite clear. And this allows quite a lot of light to go in. And it's very exciting environment to explore, although not very easy to access. And our study began like, I was always interested in diving deep. And we realized there was a big gap of knowledge in those deep corals. And actually, once we talked with a fisherman at a party, retirement party, and we asked him, ah, do you know like a good spot for finding deep corals, like around 40 meters or so? And he answered us, ah, yeah, I fish them sometimes. I said, what? OK, so next time you fish them, please bring them to us. And literally, like a few days later, he came with two buckets. And in one bucket was Seriatopora hystrix that you can see on the picture here. And we were extremely surprised because this species had this had disappeared from the shallow reef in front of the station. And it used to be quite common in the shallow reef, but it completely disappeared following some bleaching events. But then like this fisherman brings us some extinct coral. And so, yeah, I just fished them. So we immediately asked him the site and we dove there and we found they were everywhere at 40 meter and very healthy population. So this was kind of a perfect model for looking at the deep reef refugia hypothesis because this species was not extinct. It was just still present at depths. However, coral, for those of you who try to identify coral species, they are a pain in the neck. They can change their morphology depending on the condition. So did the seriatopora we found at 40 meter, were they the same as the one, the same species as the shallow corals or were they simply a deep seriatopora species that was there and that is completely different? And so we did a bit of genetics and we did not go, actually at that time we did not go to population genetics, but what we found is we found three big groups all over Okinawa from shallow to depth because there were still some place we could find shallow uh, on different islands. We could find shallow seriatopora. So we included all what we could find. And what we found is that there were three groups. We looked at two different markers and both of them showed three big groups. And as you can see here with the colors, like there is not a single group that is only deep or only shallow. So even though we have maybe cryptic species, they are present everywhere. And we looked also at the morphology and yes, we found different morphologies, also three rough different morphologies. But those morphologies do not match the DNA at the moment. So uh, we are not sure what is going on. Most likely, they are three different species. They are found every depth. And so MCs, uh, MCs can be a refuge for at least these species. Now we work with uh, Dr. Yasuda at the University of Tokyo, who is a population genetist. And she looked at a finer scale of genetic information with mixed sex sequencing with really population genetic approach. And she sees some distinction between some shallow and deep population. So there might be some stratification, but at least at a large, let's say species level, there is still some communication. So I think it's just a question of time scale. Like at longer time scale, there is some exchange, but at shorter, generation time, they are more together between the depths. However, uh, when we found those mesophotic uh, uh, communities of Seriatopora, it was 10 years after the massive bleaching event that killed the Seriatopora in the shallow. So we don't really know what happened at 40 meter during this bleaching event. Did they also, did they die? Did they bleach and recovered? or were they actually really protected by the depths? And unfortunately for the corals, but kind of fortunately for our research, 
in 2016, there was a massive bleaching event in Ishigaki in the south of the prefecture. And we went to survey there in August and in November. The reason we went there is because the temperature is changing. It's much more stratified in August. You can see in August, the temperature was above 30 degrees up to 20 meter, and then it reduced drastically and below 30 meter, it's quite low. However, if we go later in the season, the water mix and then the deeper water will warm up because the warm water from the top will be mixed. And so, for example, if you go at 45 meter, the temperature is warmer at like in November than in August. So this is why we had those two, two times, because we wanted to see the survival also. Like in August, we might not have caught bleaching at mesophotic, but in November, if there was bleaching and mortality, we would have caught it. And what we saw, and this figure was made by Dr. Kumagai, a collaborator also from uh, the National Institute of Environment, Environmental Studies, and he's an expert in big data analysis, so he could make this fancy figure. Um, it looks good, but mainly what is important to see is you have the depths here in the horizontal axis and the percentage of bleaching on the vertical axis. And you can see below 30 meter, there is almost no bleaching, no matter which site we were. Um, there is no data basically from zero to five meter because the sites we explored were mesophotic sites and those sites did not extend to above five meter or often about eight meter, above eight meter. So, but what you can see is there is a really peak of bleaching between 10 and 20 meter. And then it's decreasing very rapidly from 20 to 30 and below 30, it's basically 0% bleaching. So basically this deep reef refugia hypothesis is supported. Like there is clearly less coral bleached below 20 meter and nothing be below 30 meter. Uh, but this is one thing they can survive. But there is one other aspect of the deep reef refugia hypothesis is that those refugee coral should also recede the degraded shallow reef because it's not a refuge. If you cannot escape it, then it's a prison, it's a jail. So we need to know how they reproduce. And this is very important, of course, for the recolonization of the shallow reef, but it's also very important for the connectivity between the different mesophotic ecosystems. And so this is where I enter a little bit into Saki's world, and I hope my explanation will be as good as she would do. Um, but so we have those two, like the corals that will recede the shallow reef and also communicate with, uh, connect with other deep reef. And the first question is, when do they spawn? When do they release the larvae? And for that, we have deep preferential. So deep preferential is our corals that we will find mostly at mesophotic depths. And we have depth generalists that are corals that we find all over the depths. And those depth generalists are the ones that could maybe contribute to shallow reef recovery. But I will just start with uh, deep preferential species. And this is basically the work of the master thesis and PhD thesis of Dr. Rian Prezetia, who is now back in Indonesia and he came to Okinawa for his master and PhD. Uh, he was one of the first PhD students of the lab and I'm still missing him in the lab. He was really a, a great researcher. Uh, and I think he's still doing very good thing in Indonesia. Uh, so Acroporatinella is a very abundant uh, coral at one of our sites, so it was very easy to sample a lot. It's known from the Western Central Pacific and supposedly it ranges from 25 to 70 meter depth. So it's rather a deep preferential, but we don't know anything about their reproduction. And you can see this is a picture of uh, our site. Uh, they are really everywhere. I just want to attract your attention on the, just above the 40 meter depth, there is some purple area, and this is a sponge. And I will briefly mention it a bit later, but so you will have seen it. Uh, this is a sponge competing with the corals. Uh, so what Rian did is he collected corals monthly, 
Uh, he did histology decalcification, not very exciting, um, but he got really nice results on observing the the oocytes and the spermaries. And you can see that the oocyte diameter increase and the oocyte diameter increase here, and the spermaries also increase, and then suddenly they disappear. In after in September there was nothing, and then from October he start to see all sites, small all sites again, that will then increase, increase. So basically the all genesis takes almost one year, like ten months, and the spermatogenesis is much shorter, and so we expected the spawning to be around July, August, or maybe June, July, August. And he really, really tried hard to observe the spawning. Almost like I think during the night, he was staying awake to observe every hour the corals, if they would release eggs. And during the day, he would put a GoPro to film the tank while he was catching some sleep. And after I think two weeks of doing that, we told him, no, no, you will, you will get exhausted. Like stop, like just turn off the water current and you will see in the morning. And I think the second night after he stopped, in the morning, he could see eggs. Unfortunately, because it was in the morning, uh, he could not catch the bundles. And so we don't know how many colonies spawned, if we could have fertilization or not. They did not fertilize, but at least we know they spawned like during the night. And it was actually very similar timing to the shallow corals. Uh, and they are positively brilliant, which is also interesting because that means that from 40 meters, they will go up the surface, probably to fertilize at the surface. But that's also raising the question of how do they go back down? Because 40 meters is a long way for a little larvae to swim and to, to reach a suitable place. So that's an open question that deserves some studies. So then we moved to a uh, depth generalist coral. And the main depth generalist coral we have here is Seriatopora hystrix. It's, it became our pet following this discovery. And it is very interesting because it could contribute to shallow reef recovery. So the first question was, when do they reproduce? And again, Rian went back at it, collected a lot of them, cut them, and one interesting thing with Seriatopora is that they are brooding larvae. And at some point, we observe like some colonies, if you look at them under the blue light, they have lots of uh, GFP green fluorescent protein, and they are all bright green. But some colonies had almost no GFP, just the red fluorescence of the algae. And inside of the polyp, and that's the image you see at the bottom, there were some polyp that glowed green. And this is because their larvae was green. So we could see basically pregnant polyps. We could see the larvae inside of the colonies. And yeah, this was very exciting. And so he started not only to do the collection, but the, to culture the colonies and see how many larvae they release every night. And uh, he could get this kind of graph with the colonies with planulae and then nothing, empty colonies. And, he has a similar graph, I did not show it here, but with the release of the larvae. And so he could collect those larvae, he could compare it with the shallow reef, the data we have from shallow reef, and it is a shorter period, which makes sense. Uh, there is less energy, they will reduce their, um, their reproduction effort. Also, the water takes more time to warm, so it might be delayed. And yeah, just overall, it is shorter. It is matching with what other colleagues found from the Red Sea, for example. And uh, one thing that um, was interesting is that he could get larvae and he could make some small experiment with the larvae. And so we decided to see what can we do with those larvae? Can we transplant them to shallow? So he played in the lab with them. He also checked their behavior in cylinder and that's interesting because basically those larvae will tend to crawl at the bottom. They will just not go so much in the open water and they will settle very rapidly. But under a different light condition, like corresponding to five meter, 10 meter, 20 meter and 40 meter, the difference were quite striking. And you can see that basically at 40 meter, 
they settle very rapidly and they are basically quite happy campers. Uh, at 20 meter, we have a little bit more larvae that are just not really convinced by the settling spot and they will just keep swimming. And if we go to 10 meter and even five meter, they are much less happy to settle and even they are more dying. So it's not so good for settling in the shallow and actually they were not very healthy as you can see here. Those are like bleached larvae or juveniles or dying uh, larvae at uh, five or 10 meter light. And at 20, 40 meter, they look healthy. They are full of Symbiodinia same and they are happy. So after that, we tried to see in situ because in the lab, it's one thing. In situ is another thing. So we transplant them on plastic plate because we had discovered that they really like clean plastic plates more than the fancy tiles we provided them. And so we transplanted them on the reef in both exposed. And on the second year, we also put them in shaded condition because many coral larvae will like a little bit protected places to settle. And so we deployed them at three to five meter, 20 meter and 40 meter. And after six months, uh, Rian looked uh, at the survival. And so this is our site at 40 meter uh, where he deployed. And then at three to five meter, he also deployed them really on the reef. And the survival was actually a little bit as we would expect, at least for the 40 meters, like naturally, larvae will die massively in the first months. So this is a normal graph to, to expect. Uh, what was surprising is that at 20 meter, they did actually better than at 40 meter. And at the shallow, like on the exposed side, they did not like at all. When we put them on the shaded side the next year, they survived a bit better in the shallow, but still none of them made it to the six months. But 20 meter, they did well. They were happy. They grew even more than at 40 meter. And so this is uh, this is quite interesting finding. And so in summary, they reproduce shorter at depths. The larvae may not survive very long, and they crawl on the bottom, which does not make them very good for dispersing very very shallow. In addition, when they reach the, when they would reach the shallow they are not so healthy, but they can survive longer under shaded condition. So the direct jump is probably not really happening. But because at 20 meters they are good, possibly 20 meters could act as a stepping stone. And there is one thing I want to point out is that all our experiments show that 3 to 5 meters is not good for Seriatopora. However, now like it's more than 10 years, we go to the same site and we start to see Seriatopora coming back. And this was uh, this year we found this colony at four meter depths. So although our experiment show that it's not so good, they are coming back. So I think there is quite hope for this maybe stepping stone approach. Um, we see much more now up to 10 meter, 14 meter, these species is, I would not say common, but we can find them uh, quite regularly. So when we started this research with Rian, we had really trouble to find them even at 20 meter. So there is, uh, there is hope. And in terms of uh, biodiversity, so uh, I mentioned at the beginning, there is this conflict of like refuge or lifeboat and unique ecosystems and mainly Technical diver would say, no, it's unique ecosystem. The refuge is not working. It's completely different species. And then other people like including us say, yeah, but look like Seriatopora, it's working. It can be a refuge for some species. And now we live in a very bipolar world. Like either things are black or white, you're pro-Trump against Trump. Uh, like it's everything like that. But I think in research, it's not like that. And or it should not be like that. And nature does not care. Basically, they are more middle way. And so uh, let's see what we yeah, found okay. for the diversity yeah. and how we assess that. So when we dive, we dive with normal air at 40 meters. So we are quite limited in time. We have about 10, 15 minutes at 40 meter to do our stuff in one dive. So one system we 
uh, start to use is this uh, photo quadrat system that we can just hang under a diver and just put around the bottom. And this is good. It's 50 centimeter by 50 centimeter. It's quite small, but it is manageable for a diver. Uh, we can also, if it's too deep, we did quite a few quadrats at 80 meter or even 100 meter depths just by deploying it from the boat under a rope and with a time-lapse system and good lamps. And then we put 100 points, uh, which is probably a mistake because that takes a huge lot of time. But uh, me being interested in biodiversity, I was very frustrated to miss so many of the little colonies. Because one problem of the mesophotic ecosystem is that there are a low abundance, high diversity settings. So I put many points because I wanted to catch as many corals as possible, but it takes a lot of time. And then we can identify them to the genus level, and this is not even possible. Many encrusting coral, we can just say encrusting coral because from the pictures, it's very difficult to identify corals. But it gives a good idea of the community level. We can survey quite wide areas, even though we are limited. And if we want to go more to the species or more fine identification, then we need to collect samples, observe them with skeletons and genetics. So uh, just a very simple figure I made. Um, we found 49 genera over 100 species. And here what I made is simply the long bars are the species that we could find shallow and deep, or that we found deep and are known also from shallow reef in Okinawa. And the short bars are the species we could only find shallow that we don't know from the deep parts. And so uh, what you can see is there are some groups like Acropora that have quite many shallow, but also quite some deep corals. Leptoceris, I will speak a bit more about it. It's really a deep preferential genus. They like dark place. There are only a few species we find shallow and most of them are only found deep. And Poritis, they are found all over the place. They are happy, shallow and deep. And so uh, to give you uh, an overview of the diversity, first in terms of coverage, we have up to like 40, 50% coverage at around 40 meter depths, and then it's decreased a bit, but still this site is at 73 meter, if I'm not wrong. And we still have 20% coral coverage, live coral coverage, which is not bad uh, compared to even the shallow reefs we have here. Uh, we have a lot of algae. And what we see with increasing depths, and actually you can guess it on the video, there are much more uh, other entozoans, meaning gorgonians, black corals, when we go towards the depths. If we look within this coral cover, what are the what is the diversity of the corals? And I only highlighted the, the main genera. Uh, we can see an interesting trend. In the upper mesophotic, we have mostly Acropora and Porites. And then those give place to Leptoceris when we go below 50 meters and 200 meters. And then the deepest site we surveyed had almost exclusively Leptoceris corals. Uh, on the other hand, the depth generalists like Seriatopora in light blue or Pachyceris in purple, uh, they are happy at both upper and lower mesophotic. And actually, they are also in the shallow, shallow reef. Uh, recently, uh, as uh, Intan mentioned, I had the chance to be supported by the Nat Geo, Nat National Geographic Society and uh, to get technical diver and explore more in detail the deeper part of the mesophotic coral ecosystems. And you can see they are quite different from our shallow acropora dominated reef. Uh, one thing that was interesting is I got this grant right at the beginning of COVID and that screwed up a little bit all my plans for field work, for having international colleagues who were researcher and tech diver uh, to come to Okinawa. So because I did not know when Japan would reopen the borders, uh, I started to work with um, um, non-citizen, uh, non-scientist diver, just tech diving instructor from Japan that did not need any visa to enter Japan and so on. And they were super motivated by contributing to research because they are experts tech diver, uh, they like the sea. And, you know, I think tech diver, they have lots of equipment, they like gadget, they like science. 
and they like to learn. So they learned very quickly uh, about science. One thing that was very challenging was the sampling at the beginning, because uh, as recreational diver, they are always told not to touch, not to touch the coral, not to break the coral. And here I was giving them like a hammer and a chisel. And of course we had the, the permit and so on, but I, yeah, please collect the, those corals that you see. And they they told me later that they really struggled with the idea of breaking the corals to collect them. But then I showed them what we do with the corals and how much we can learn. And we also give some guidelines on how to ethically correct as, as much as possible the corals. So this was really great. This was awesome. And uh, I hope this will lead to long-term collaboration with those kind of advanced citizen science. But uh, what it allowed us to find was the deepest corals in Japan. And mostly it's Leptoceris fragilis and some echinophilia. And we could beat the Professor Yamazato's record from 1967 by about one or two meter only. But well, we still found the deepest coral in Japan at 104 meter. Uh, I'm still working on those samples. Uh, one thing that is interesting so far is that the symbionts they host are the same as the shallow corals. They are not like deep adapted symbionts. And this is a quite interesting finding. It's actually matching what uh, our colleague found from um, French Polynesia at 172 meters. Um, and yeah, uh, you can see the Leptoceris fragilis here on the two pictures. Uh, so those are the deepest uh, corals. And so to speak a little bit about Leptoceris and why it takes me so long to identify them, uh, Leptoceris is often considered as the queen of mesophotic corals because it's a coral that like dark environment. They are really well adapted to use every little bit of light energy that is present. And in Okinawa, we are very lucky because there are 17 species described in the Indo-Pacific, but we have 15 of those species. And the two species we don't have are species that have been recently described that are known only from their type locality. And actually they are not mesophotic species. So it's a very good place to look at uh, Leptoceris diversity. And I got inspired by a colleague's work from Hawaii where they, um, Daniel Luck, and Sam Kong observed the uh, Leptoceris in Hawaii and they did DNA and they got a very beautiful phylogenetic tree with morphology matching the species. It was very easy and I said, okay, I will do the same with my corals. And so I got a very beautiful phylogenetic tree too with different plates. I just put them in color here for the examples. However, we have also very well morphologically defined species. For example, these Leptoceris foliosa and interestingly, this Leptoceris foliosa comes here, it comes here, and it comes here. And then Leptoceris papyracea here is also coming here, here, and here. So basically the, the genetic and the morphology don't tell at all the same story. And uh, Sam and Daniel in Hawaii we're saying, yeah, but we need to look under the SEM at the very fine microstructure, which I did. And there is indeed difference in the microstructure, but again, it is not matching the DNA. So, and then I compared actually with another nuclear marker. It's just even more confusing. So what we need is we need more marker, mainly we need new molecular approaches and we need more skeletal observation. And my guess is simply in Hawaii, the diversity is very poor. It's very isolated. And probably there is only a very few colonization event of species that stayed apart, very, that are very distinct. They evolved and they came once to Hawaii. In Okinawa, we are connected to Philippines and the Coral Triangle by the Kuroshio Current. And we have much higher diversity and corals don't really care about species. So we might have a much more complicated evolution of corals, much more confused story. And that's maybe why the, the few genes I observed are not really matching the morphology that is quite uh, convincing. So this is a work in progress and I hope I can clarify the situation uh, soon. And how does Okinawa compare to the world? So I mentioned that Hawaii here in yellow has less than 10 different coral genera. 
uh, the Caribbean as 13 coral genera, and those two areas are where the most mesophotic research is conducted and published. And you can see in Indonesia, like there is some, some information, but not much. And this is a very big gap. And so for me, this is a problem in mesophotic research because most of the big theories are made in places that are actually very low diversity places, exceptionally low diversity places. And I think it's not corresponding to what we see in our region in the, in the Asia Pacific. And Okinawa with our few limited study and 49 genera found, we are not far from the whole Red Sea or the Great Barrier Reef, uh, which is quite an uh, interesting place then for studying mesophotic. And I will just make a small uh, parenthesis to show one uh, little study we had a chance to make about the, the dynamics of those coral communities. And because uh, at the Deep Sea Center, I don't know if you have access to nice deep sea equipment like ROV or AUV, but uh, I was on a deep sea cruise with some colleagues who were using this little AUV to look at a hydrothermal vent. And they were saying how expensive it is to test their equipment in the deep sea because they need an oceanographic vessel and it's very expensive and difficult. And we discussed and say, well, why don't you come test your things in our mesophotic reef? You, you don't need a big vessel. It's much more accessible. The water is warmer. It's more transparent. Like it's, uh, it's more light. It's easier. And little by little, we developed this project. And for three years, they came and they mapped this 25 by 25 meter area of the reef. And uh, they made a photo mosaic. And you can see it's a quite nice resolution. You can see quite well the corals. You cannot identify maybe the species, but uh, it's probably equivalent to what we can do with our photo quadras almost. And there is a 3D reconstruction that is not perfect, but that gives also some information on the rugosity. Over the three years they came, so they came in 2016, 17, and 18. And in 2018, it was three days after a typhoon passed over us. And you can see that the coral, like if we follow single coral like this pachyceris, even within one year, it grew quite significantly. And we could still track it after the typhoon here. The typhoon made clear damage, but uh, those communities are not fixed. They are quite dynamic. They die, they grow quite rapidly. Although people tend to think they are deeper, they have less energy, they will grow very slow. This is maybe not true. But it's also showed that they are not immune to storms and to different threats. And this is a direction we took also a bit more recently, is to look at the threats on those mesophotic coral ecosystem. And, um, the the cruise ship picture you see is a picture we had we took a morning when we came to a station. So our station is on an island. We need to cross a bridge, and this very this uh, cruise ship was anchored right on our study site. And so we were quite shocked. Luckily, we discussed with them. They never came again. We showed them pictures. Say, hey, like there are corals where you are anchoring your boat. They understood. We never saw them again. That was good. Um, but in other places, like uh, the bottom left picture, you can see a barrel here. And there was other construction trash. And this is in a national park in Okinawa at 40 meters. And this tire, I took, I think, in the Philippines. Uh, so they, they are trash. They are littering. Uh, there is potentially overfishing. It's really targeted by fishermen. In 2018, uh, with our little ROV, we found this very nice community of Leptoceris. And I hope you will not be seasick just watching at the screen because it was me piloting the ROV. But you can see there are lots of uh, corals. It was really amazing. And in the last years when the tech diver came, um, they were not going to this site exactly. They were going a bit deeper, but they transited over this site. And in this, in their video, we can see you can see those tracks, those white tracks in the reef. And those are just tracks of anchor reaping on the bottom on those coral communities from those construction ships. And so those construction ships just anchored there because on the map, there is no indication that there are corals there. And so this is for me the very good illustration of why we need to explore like, and we don't always need to study place we know. We know there are corals, we go there. We also need to go somewhere where we don't know what there is at the bottom and see what there is because we cannot protect what we don't know. And in this case, 
we tried to discuss with the construction company and the ministry in charge of this. Uh, they showed interest. I must say, at the moment, we did not see any difference. Their ships are still there and probably still destroying the reefs. But just if people are not informed that there are corals, they absolutely cannot avoid those areas. So this is very important. So uh, just to summarize briefly, um, mesophotic coral diversity has a big potential of new species. And at the moment, I'm a bit struggling because the coral can be uh, plastic morphologically. So the coral I observe are different from the shallow species. Is it because they are in lower light and they change their morphology? Or is it because they are different species? And this is a difficult question to answer, but I hope to answer it at least for some species. Uh, we have many shallow corals that we confirmed that, uh, that can be found in upper mesophotic depths. And potentially, some of them could recolonize shallow reef in a step-by-step -step process. So overall, like the MC biodiversity is important ecologically, both for the shallow reef and for the deep communities. And we still don't know many things about them, but they are already threatened by human activities. And so just uh, to, to finish and maybe to open some way of discussing together, uh, I will just mention some of our ongoing research, mainly some student projects and some future perspectives that we have. So as I mentioned, now we are trying to think about the threats to mesophotic coral ecosystem. And this is Ritz, our PhD student from the Philippines, who is working on that. And she's now finishing her PhD. She had some really great finding on those sponges that compete with coral. You can see in the picture on the top here. This is Kalinula. This is a, and it's on a Astropora, I think. And it's really competing with the corals. And also, these communities can be disturbed by typhoon, by anchors. How can they recover? How they can connect with each other? And knowing the reproduction is one thing. Uh, knowing the recruitment is another thing. And this is also like uh, read PhD, Anga's master. Anga is another Indonesian student we have in the lab now, and he did his master on the recruitment, and his PhD will continue a little bit on those disturbance and recovery. And we have another Japanese student, Hiromi, who is studying the, trying to increase the information we have on the reproduction of those mesophotic corals. And finally, we have a fourth student like Meron who will look at the Symbiotic community, so the Symbiotic algae, and how do those compare with depths uh, in a better way than I did with just my small comparison on the deepest corals. And uh, this is work we have with collaborators in Taiwan and elsewhere to try to connect eDNA, soundscape, and biodiversity. So we have we are listening now to the reef at different depths and trying to, to see how we could use that to monitor the health of the reef. And finally, and uh, this is something very important, I think, for this seminar is how does mesophotic diversity change across latitudes and how those pieces from Japan are connected across the area. And uh, Suharto from Hassanuddin University is now working on a first survey of the diversity and distribution of mesophotic coral ecosystems in Indonesia. And I think there is really a lot of work to do. We are also working with Dr. Kapaitan in the Philippines. And I hope that all the topics I mentioned during our talk, um, I hope we could maybe connect them with research in Indonesia, in the Philippines, in Malaysia, because we need to have a wider view of the ecosystems in our Asia Pacific region to, to show some real image, real models, uh, to oppose to those low diversity models coming from the Caribbean or Hawaii. Because I think we cannot apply the same rules and we know the diversity we have in our ecosystems. We know that we cannot make a single route. There is not one typical mesophotic ecosystem, but there are tons of different communities. And so I hope that we can build maybe a nice network of Asia Pacific mesophotic researchers. So uh, thank you for uh, all. Uh, first of all, to Saki Hari, who is leading the lab since several years, um, to all the students, past and present member of the lab, and to the different colleagues that contribute, uh, Michel Pichon from Australia, 
who is now retired, but helped me a huge lot with the taxonomy, with the identification, and different other colleagues who discussed, who helped with sampling, and so on. Uh, the tech diver who came to Okinawa and helped, and yeah, funding and stuff. And thank you to you for your attention, and I'm happy to take on any question or discussion. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Frederick, uh, for such nice presentations. I think we learned a lot about the, the issues uh, in the mesophotical research and also opportunities uh, that we need to push, uh, for example, because you can't stay too long in deeper uh, depths, then it's important to come up with technology that will map it faster uh, and more automatic. Um, and that's, that was actually really interesting, that argument that uh, about the anchor. Uh, they, they probably, because they don't know, they didn't know there's a good reef over there. And I think that's something that uh, could be highlighted more uh, and also push research on mesopotic corals because we need to map these ecosystems to avoid being uh, destroyed. And also we haven't even touched uh, how we can do bioprospecting with all of this ecosystem, which to, to many people that means you know industry and so on so uh we do have also groups that uh, one research group on uh bioprospections um and we also have you you met sam uh he's on the connectivity but uh yeah so i would like to invite uh people for question from for frederick you can raise your hands or um yeah welcome Silakan Bapak Ibu kalau ada pertanyaan untuk Pak Frederick. Uh, perhaps me uh Intan. Silakan. Yeah, uh, thank you Frederick for your uh, very nice presentation and and actually I I have a lot of uh, research questions just pop up on my <laughs> on my head when you presenting everything and Oh, that's uh, nice. But uh, I have a general, like general perspective, also a general question about about the mesophotic because uh, yeah, we all we know that uh, the mesophotic area is a refugee uh, place for a coral, a shallow uh, coral reef uh, community. So once I I think uh, about this uh, mesophotic, then I will think that uh, because this is uh, like uh, the refugee uh, place, then it should in the, in the future, the mesophotic uh, coral ecosystem, uh, the biodiversity will increase rapidly because uh, this is a refugee, right? Uh, but uh, in your presentation for one species, I I see that uh, even though this is the place for refugees, but sometimes they also uh, went uh, go up to the the, the original place. So, uh, and also uh, we know that uh, some of us, most of our uh, shallow water, uh, shallow coral reef, also they they have capability to recover after a typhoon, after a storm, after a breaching, something like that. So we can see in the uh, GPR that some some uh, species also can can uh, can survive after uh, the uh, after the, the the problem something like that. So uh, it's like it 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 doesn't confuse me, but uh, uh, it enriches my knowledge that uh, even though uh, the mesophotic uh, as the refugees but they also uh, but some of uh, cor uh, shallow shallow coral can can recover by by themselves so uh, so what do you think about the, this this uh, like uh, because uh, what I said uh, I'm thinking about which which one should be protected so I'm I'm talking about uh, the conservation the next conservation because after we uh, know about the these uh, two typical different typical uh, places. So what's next for in in the terms of conservation? 
So that's that's my general question uh, like that. Yeah. Yes, I I think for for me my view and really we we don't know so many things about metaphotic that it's difficult to give a clear answer. But what I see at the moment is that there is no one rule fits all. I feel it's there. There is not really one one scheme like you said like. Some species will be able to recover by themselves, but some species may come from the deep. Some species may not come from the deep. So um, it's it's difficult to to decide. Sorry, I stopped. Yeah. Um, are you here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ah, okay, okay. Yeah. Um, so it's difficult to to say one way or the other because, for example, for the conservation. Imagine you have two mesophotic reefs. You have one with very high diversity, but not shallow coral diversity, very unique mesophotic diversity. And then you have another reef that is um, another mesophotic community that is very low diversity, but that, that, that has some shallow corals. Which one do you choose? Do you choose the one with the shallow coral species that has less diversity, or do you choose the one that has high diversity? And it, it's kind of an Im impossible solution. You, you should choose both. But um, yeah, I, I think it's really a case by case. And I think we really need more basic um, mapping knowledge, modeling knowledge to be able to make a balance, to, to make compromise between unique diversity and between the refuge potential. And maybe to say, well, this place is important for this purpose, and this place is important for this purpose, and we need to protect both to some extent. Yeah. Oh, very I, nice. Thank yes. you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Bung Sam. Any more question? Giri, Bung Giri. Yes. Uh, first of all, good day, Frederick, and all of us. Uh, thanks for your uh, insight for the presentation. I have probably two questions, uh, starting with the thermal refugee provided by mesopotic uh, coral. So basically, if there's a growing uh, convention that there will be a rapid forward follow expansion of the coral under uh, warming ocean, which means that there will be decline in the tropic and also there will be increase a little bit or probably uh, significant in the, in the subtropic. I'm happy that you touch a great barrier reef because uh, Great Barrier Reef is a good example. Uh, there's a growing evidence that south, uh, south shelf of the Great Barrier Reef now becomes like more diverse compared to the mid and the uh, outer. And one uh, good explanation is that because during the spawning on the mid uh, shelf of the Great Barrier Reef, there will be like a, a horizontal transfer of the of the of the larva from due to probably east. Australian current that moves the larva to the south, which is a good evidence about the the migration horizontal migration or polar work migration uh, to mitigate the thermal stress. But then uh, I was expecting that your ex uh, explanation on the on the mesopotic coral as a refugee. So which means that if we have uh, like a shallow coral being stressed by the the high temperature. It should be migrate downward, right? That's a, a philosophy, right? But maybe I I I miss the point, or maybe I uh, please confirm me that probably tell me a little bit about the the mechanism that move toward the the. So, for example, if you have like a thermal set on the shallow water, the response should be the movement of the like probably. Uh, the larva is spawning to move downward to, to find the cool cool water or cool ecosystem. And so but on your side it seems that you, you explain about the migration upward, which is quite understandable because there's like an internal wave or something like that. So would you like to explain it a bit so that because and then that will be the mitigation, the real uh, role of the thermal refugee from mesopotic uh, uh, coral. The other thing, the second question actually, we know exactly that uh, there will be an optimum uh, temperature for coral to live. And uh, 
above or below that uh, interval of the temperature, there will be bleaching. So not only that uh, bleaching will occur due to a uh, thermal surf, due to a uh, warming climate, but also because of the cool, cool uh, temperature. I was wondering if is there any evidence that uh, uh, cool water driven uh, bleaching in, in Okinawa uh, in your, your region? And probably the last question, if it is possible, I noticed that in Okinawa there's like a Kurizo, Kuris, Kurisu Kurisu yeah. that's really really connected to the Enzo mechanism. So it's sort of like an Enzo teleconnection. To what extent or how significant those uh uh interannual variability affect the bleaching in 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 the in your region? Thank you very much. Sorry. Uh, your questions are excellent. So uh, I'm really happy you asked them because the regarding the first question, indeed, we started to look the dispersal like from deep to shallow because that was the start of the deep ref refugia hypothesis. But uh, right now, actually, what is paying my salary is a project from Saki to explore exactly what is the potential for corals to migrate deeper in the future and like that we would have a bold world migration but also a depth world migration of the corals uh, one problem is we know very little of the depth distribution of the corals at the moment because all the research was made in shallow reef and not many people really explored the depth so our first step is to look at these depths like how they extend and uh, one part uh, that we are working with Dr. Kumagai uh, is if we feed him data on the different distribution of the corals and the environmental parameters, uh, he can do magic in the modeling and try to model the future, which corals can potentially expand deeper or not uh, in different contexts of scenarios. So uh, please give us a few years to answer fully your questions, but uh, this is a very good idea. And this is actually uh, what uh, Saki is doing on the moment at the moment. Um, the, the second question was, uh, remind me actually, what was the second point? So the second question is that, is there any possible for the cool water driven bleaching in your region? Ah, yes, like yes, that? yes. So yes, that that we have, and actually, just uh, before regarding the um, the depths, uh, the depths migration. One interesting point that uh, actually I'm working on with Suharto is um, Seriatopora that we studied extensively here is a weak species for bleaching, for thermal bleaching. However, in Indonesia, you have lots of Seriatopora everywhere in the shallow reefs too, and your average temperature is like 30 degree or so. And it's the stressing temperature he here in Okinawa. But Seriatopora is very happy at this temperature in Indonesia. So now with Suharto, we are trying to see, first of all, is it the same Seriatopora or are they like different? Are there some Indonesian Seriatopora species versus more Okinawan species? But if they are the same species, that might also give some light of there might be hope for those Indonesian seriatopora to disperse, like to migrate forward and like help the Okinawan seriatopora to, to take on because that means they are able to survive these deaths. Uh, regarding the cold bleaching, yes, we do have uh, regularly in winter, like the coldest time of the year is about January, February here. And especially when there are low tides, uh, we sometimes see Acropora bleached or a few colonies white. Uh, it is never so far that I saw, it's never massive and it's always very shallow because uh, surprisingly, actually, often the water can be warmer, deeper. It is unstable situation. I know physically it should not be like that, but the surface layer, if you just make a, a cast with a CTD, the, the water is warmer, deeper. Uh, because we have in, in Okinawa, we have very, very strong uh, north wind coming from Siberia that is super cold. Like the, imagine the water temperature is about 20 degrees or so, but the air can be like five, 
or less than 10 degree wind blowing. So it, there is a very, very strong difference of temperature. And I think the cooling is so rapid in the surface layer that the surface water can get very cold, especially yeah, at low tide when the volume of water is very limited above the corals. So we see that, but it's not dramatic to be honest. Like at least I did not feel dramatic even, but I did not study that in particular. And um, regarding the the variability, yes, we have bleaching years. We we have some worse years, and I feel they tend to be to be more um, close to each other, like the bleaching events we see. Uh, this year we were very close, I think, to a uh, massive bleaching events, and thankfully we had a typhoon coming that mixed the water. So, uh, in in Okinawa there is a maybe inter annual variation, but there is also a very random effect of the typhoon. The typhoons are very very important to cool the water and mix the water, and they allow to kind of reset the the temperature and the stratification, and so. The the worst case we can have is a year, a summer without typhoon and with just blue sky. And then the water will warm and bleach. But as soon as there is one typhoon, one storm, this breaks. So it's difficult to, at least at my level of knowledge, it's difficult to link it to the big like um, El Nino and La Nina circulation. But I am not an oceanographer or a climate, climate researcher. So uh, yeah, my competence are very limited in this field. Thank you. Uh, so uh, Gary is a physical oceanographer, uh, actually, <laughs> yes. um, and he did his PhD in uh, in Australia. Uh, so yeah, there's a lot of uh, interesting physical oceanographic and modeling studies uh, related to uh, mesophotic corals in this case. And he's uh, in the same group with Sam. Yes, and okay. actually one thing about the internal yeah. wave and the cold stress is uh, I think internal wave can actually be an issue and cold stress might be one of the big limitation factors for the deepest limit of the corals. And uh, we were surprised in a Komodo area to see mesophotic corals did not extend much deeper than 40 meters. And the communities we would see at 40 meters were very similar to what we see at 100 meters here in Okinawa, which was completely unexpected for me. And either it is because of the turbidity during the rainy season that makes the water very dark for too long time, or it is because the currents are so crazy there and there might be some upwelling information. But yeah, for that, we would be actually very much looking for having temperature or current profile from different region. And I think uh, Suharto is trying to find those environmental data that could help us understand why the corals are distributed like that. OK, um, uh, we can have more more questions. Silakan, Bapak Ibu, kalau masih ada pertanyaan. Can I have one? <laughs> yeah, <Sorry>. yeah, of <laughs> course. Yeah. Uh, thank you, uh, Bainta. Uh, thank you, Frederick. So uh, now I'm uh, concerned about your uh, your of uh, your study, uh, both in in the lab experiments and also in the field. And I saw that uh, you have different results because in in the lab experiment you found that uh, 40 meters is the best uh, location like that, but in the field you found that it's in the 20 meters. So um, what I thought uh, when you uh, presented that, well, I thought that in, maybe in the field, when, when the, the larvae uh, migrate to the deep, they already acclimate for, acclimate for the, the condition, environmental condition in the 20 meters, then they already felt like uh, comfortable with this uh, place, then they stayed there. Then they didn't migrate uh, deeper to 40 meters. So uh, from these two different different uh, different results between the lab and the uh, field experiments, so do you think uh, for coral leaf, uh, mesophotic coral reef, it is better to do the, to conduct the research in straight away in the field rather than uh, in the lab 
So what what do you think? Because uh, maybe in the future our our research group will will also do the same uh, in the future. So uh, what do you suggest uh, best doing in the lab or in the in the field uh, straight away? Yeah, uh, thank you. I think as much as possible, uh, I would recommend to do in the field, of course. However, there are many observations you cannot conduct in the field, like observing the larval behavior or even observing spawning. We are trying to observe that, but you know, you have 10 minutes in at at 40 meters, you have 10 minutes diving. So if you want to see a, a mesophotic called spawn it's much simpler to have it in a tank that you can just stay for one hour or check every 20 minutes your coral and see how it's spawning. Then if you need to go down in 10 minutes. Of course, with technology, if, you, if we can develop and we are trying to explore any possibility to work with engineer to maybe develop some camera system that could observe the spawning in the field, uh, that would be great. So, there they are things you cannot do in the field and also for the warming temperature. Uh, it might be interesting to be able to warm the corals in the field, but, and, and I know some researcher who did that, who just put some heated plate, not for corals, but for different bentos. They were just putting some heating plates on the reef and see what, what comes. But this is technically very challenging. So there are some experience you need to do in the lab, unfortunately. Uh, in the field also, I think there is one thing to consider is the random aspect. Even when we do our recruitment study and we do, I think the maximum that is physically possible, like humanly possible to, to put many tiles, but the reefs are so big that like with the Seriatopora colony that we now see at four meters, it's maybe just, you know, one larvae that came over a very large reef and that settled here. So to catch it with some settlement plate might be very difficult. And so we need to, to accept that the field might give different uh, results than the lab or than the experiment because just uh, the lab is much larger in the nature on the reef, the number of species. And there is this random effect that just one coral might come here by chance and survive. And this happens and you can do the experiment 10 times, it will never happen. And one time it might happen. Also at 20 meters, they are happy, but if there is a big bleaching, we saw for example, uh, alveopora, a different coral in 2016, uh, we could see very well where they were because all the colonies were white at 20 meters. So I am feeling maybe 20 meters is a good place for them under normal condition, but they are more exposed to some stress. Well, maybe 40 meter, uh, those corals, I mean, it may be a bit less ideal, but they are more protected. And of course, we don't know with the climate change and global warming, we might have marine heat wave hitting the 40 meter zone, and then we will see probably drastic bleaching because those corals are not used to the stress. Now the corals in the shallow, maybe the weak species disappeared and only the resistant coral are left in the shallow reef. But when heat wave will hit for the first time, the 40 meter zone, it might be a devastation. Uh, hopefully it will not happen so soon, but yeah. Um, I, I think we, for me, I would really, if I, if I was manager, if I was very rich, I would certainly focus a lot of the effort on the field and environmental observation. Uh, because this is really essential. And then what you cannot do, you observe in the lab. Yeah. Nice. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you, Frederick. If there is no more hand raised or question, last chance for any I question. Do. Okay, yeah. go ahead. <laughs> uh, this thank is you. the biologist, yeah. Oh, yeah. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Frederick Sininger. Uh, I just wondering to know about... Uh, uh, actually, what kinds of or what types of coral that can be used as a bioindicator in the pollution or in the bleaching area that survive in the bleaching area or kinds of like that? Or can we say that uh, Seriatopora uh, is the specific sp species uh, more common found in the in the mesopotic zone 
kind of like that. And why do you use ITS2 and intergenic region of mitochondria as marker in your in, in your research? I just okay. uh, yeah, because it's common also in other species in animal from the marine. Yeah, thank you. Yes. So thank you for your question. Actually, they are very good. So corals as bioindicators, I think it is um, very difficult to give you some species. For example, yes, Seriatopora in Okinawa, it is sensitive to bleaching. So it would be, I think, a good warning indicator that when Seriatopora bleach, it's like the first warning. Um, for, I'm not sure it's the dominant coral at depth. It's, what I what I saw in Okinawa is that it's very patchy. In one place you will have lots of seriatopora, but you go 50 meters away or 100 meters away, and then it's another genus of coral that takes the that dominates the field. It, it is very patchy, and at the moment I honestly don't understand. I wish, like I aim to get enough knowledge on those communities and the environmental parameters that we could be able to model that to say, okay, we have this bottom profile, this condition, we expect to find this community. Uh, but at the moment, almost every place we go is different. There is very few places I feel, ah, I saw this community already there. With the murky, the, the very calm bay, for example, with lots of sediments, we see some leptosary species that might be actually quite resistant to sedimentation. So. Uh, those could be also some indicators for some environmental parameters. But for pollution and things like that, I am really not sure which species are resistant. Um, yes, I could not tell you like that. Maybe some massive corals tend to be maybe more robust, um, more long-lived and robust. Poritis is very robust, but I'm not sure then you can use it really as a bioindicator. Um, as for the markers, so the the marker I use, uh, it's a bit a random random aspect. So for the um, for the seriatopora, the reason I use the mitochondrial region is simply based on a colleague study who suggested that this region is variable. Uh, one big problem we have for corals is to find variability. Uh, you maybe know CO one. Uh, that is widely used for barcoding insects and things like that. And it's almost not variable between different coral species. They all have the same or one base difference. So it's a big struggle to find something that is informative. And so in this aspect, the intergenic region uh, looked good for both Seriatopora and a different intergenic region for the Leptoceris showed those very great results in Hawaii that I thought I could reproduce in Okinawa, but I could not because it's too complicated here. Uh, and then ITS, um, ITS is usually very variable. It's used for Symbiodinase. Uh, I used it for Zoentarians. Uh, basically, most of my early career was based on Zoentarians, like those colonial sea anemones. And it works pretty well for, for Zoentarians. So basically when I came to corals, I told people that because people were struggling, ah, we cannot do barcoding on corals. It's difficult. Say, so, yeah, wait, wait, wait. I can do that on Zoentarians. Just I will come, I will do my magic, and I will solve everything. And no, it does not work like that at all. And now I'm hitting my head on the wall. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I'm still believing ITS has some information. Uh, recently, there was a student here, and we have some colleagues that work in Australia with the UCEs, the ultra conserved element, and those like genome wide uh approaches and this looks like uh it gives quite amazing results uh and, and uh, i was just talking with the student yesterday and or day before yesterday and he was showing me his trees of the leptoceries for example that is quite matching well the morphology i observe and i'm feeling okay maybe we need to forget these single marker things and go more for um genome-wide approach, but genome-wide approach is very expensive. You cannot do that for a general survey. But what is interesting is so far, I feel those genome-wide survey, at the end, they match the morphology. So I think we need to spend much more effort on the morphology and the 
fine microstructure of the corals because this is much more accessible to anyone like in Indonesia, in the Philippines, in the Pacific Islands. Like people can look at skeletons, can look map. Maybe you need the SCM, but this is much more accessible than a genome wide that you are dependent on one single lab that can use this technique. Yes, is that is that answers? Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Frederick. Uh, because you know, uh, if we uh learn about the specific gene or, or partial part, it's not telling about uh, anything about that species. Uh, I just uh wondering if you with your team also work with the whole genome of the of that species. So uh, sometimes when we want to know, uh, we can uh searching about the bioprospection from the genome also uh, what kinds of the potential things from that uh ones uh to publish yeah thank you yes. very much from uh your, your explanation thank you thank you everyone uh so if there are no more questions uh this is a really great discussions uh thank you frederick i think everybody's uh, have um news idea curiosity um and we can tell from the the questions uh so hopefully uh so we are actually uh proposing uh, an agreement with frederick uh and so alexis on mesopotamia corals and hopefully this could also not only bridging research but we can also visit him in okinawa i've been to okinawa Anytime. Was yeah it's nice uh so so yeah let's let's keep uh looking for avenues as frederick say you know the the corals take step by step i think mesopotic corals is uh research is one of those areas as well it has to be step by step um maybe we we do have access to technical divers but we can also start with you know uh, diving deeper uh maybe right now we don't have any secure funding we are working on it but maybe in the meantime we can work on some kind of publication on review in this region, because as Frederick said, it's actually important, not just in Indonesia, but also in the region of Western Pacific. So thank you again, Frederick. May, before I close, maybe you have uh, the la last remarks, closing remarks for everyone. Yes, I think at the at the beginning, you mentioned like you have a wide team of like chemists, bioprospection, like physical oceanographer. And I really think like we need to combine all this information into like we should not be on our own like field or biologist talk with biologists and so on because i think we need to combine all this information to understand what's going on on those reefs so yeah i hope we, we can all work together and give up something nice thank you without uh with that let, let's give applause to frederick Senegar. thank you thank you for your time and have a good day everyone have a good weekend as well Bye bye Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. I will end the meeting for all. See you all. Okay, thank you.